to test the temperature and, and see what's going on. And once it gets too hot to touch, or I have this reaction of maybe pulling my hand away, uh, that's usually around 140 to 150 degrees. That being said, we all have our own pain tolerances, right? So some days, and it fluctuates for me, it fluctuates uh, day by day, week by week. So some days I might uh, be really sensitive and I might pull my hand away uh, right when it gets hot and that might be closer to 135. And other days I might just have my hand glued on here uh, and take it way too hot because I just I keep waiting for it to be too hot to touch. Um, that being said, uh, there, we all kind of do fall within that same range and there will be a variance of about 10 degrees, but most of us will be between 140 and 150 degrees for too hot to touch. Um, also when I'm steaming, there's going to be some, some auditory cues. So if you can listen to, uh, the auditory cues that we're, we're using today, that's going to be a, a big help for you to be able to assess the temperature, uh, of your pitcher as well. So you're using your hand and you're also using sound to be able to tell what's going on uh, with your milk. So the temperature is 140 degrees to 150 degrees. That is the most basic range. Um, and we're gonna be using our hand to assess it. When it gets too hot to touch, we're gonna pull our hand away and turn the steam wand off. Uh, so now that we have this pitcher out and we've talked about temperature, let's talk about the pitcher itself. Um, Cause this is important to know like what pitcher to use and when. These are our La Marzocco home pitchers. They're brand new, they're pretty sweet. Um, what I like specifically about them, I don't know if you can see on the inside, they have milk measurements. So there's actually lines on the inside that uh, make it so you're able to assess how much milk you're putting in. So that way you're not wasting milk um, or maybe using too little milk or too much milk. Um, and we have those in both, both sizes. So this little pitcher here, the one in my right hand, this is uh, 12 ounces from top to bottom. It doesn't actually steam 12 ounces of milk though. In reality, I use a small pitcher like this for anything eight ounces or less. I could maybe even do something 10 ounces, but it'd be pushing it. And the reason for that is if I wanted to steam all the way up to the top, you can imagine that there's a high uh, chance that I'm gonna overflow the pitcher and it's gonna be a milk volcano and it's not gonna be any fun, it's gonna be super messy. So I wanna sort of uh, underfill or not use the pitcher's full capacity. So this bigger pitcher here, this is a 20 ounce pitcher from uh, bottom to top. So in a 20 ounce pitcher, I could steam anything from 10 ounces all the way up to 16 ounces of milk. In general, I find the 20 ounce pitcher works best for like 12 ounce lattes or 12 ounce cups. Um, so choose your pitcher size based on the type and size of cup that you're gonna be using. Um, so that's how I will choose my initial pitcher. And then I just need to know how much to fill. So say that you don't have uh, the lines on the inside like these pitchers do, how would you know uh, where to fill the milk to or how much milk to use? Well, you can always, in, in general, um, follow this rule of thumb. If you see where this spout is, how it comes out, I can go a pinky's width below or right to the top of my pinky. So right to the top of this, this line or just a little bit below. In general, that ends up being enough milk that um, it's going to stretch. So when I add air, the milk grows or it stretches because it gets fluffy um, and it'll stretch. It'll go from here probably up to here total. So that allows a good amount of headspace. So I'm not going to overflow my pitcher. Uh, one of the reasons I wouldn't want to put less milk in, so say just a little bit, say I wanted to make a ma macchiato or something, um, is it will cook too quickly then. Uh, so I'm adding about 260 degree uh, Fahrenheit steam to my milk and it would just immediately cook and scald. I need there to be the right amount of time where I can add air, um, which is the texture part where the steam wand is just at the surface and it's going ch -ch 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 -ch, and it's adding those big air bubbles. Um, and then time to sink the steam wand just a little bit below the surface of the milk and create a vortex, which is going to be added taking those air bubbles that I added and making them smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and that whole amount of time, uh, the longer you can make it, the better your texture will be. So uh, in general, you wanna have enough milk that it slows it down quite a bit. Cause if you have just too little, it's just going to, to scald and burn right away and you won't have any texture cause you just didn't have the time to actually uh, do that. Another way that you can slow down the process of the milk steaming is you can keep your pitchers in the fridge. Um, by keeping these pitchers nice and cold, it slows down the milk steaming. And then also, 
Obviously, this is a poor example because I have the milk sitting out behind me, but using milk that's really, really cold. So using milk that's straight out of the fridge, um, icy cold, it's going to slow down that steaming process and give you lots of time to be able to build texture, uh, which will be um, key for, for getting good uh, texture and then good latte art, which is what we all like to do, right? So today I'm going to be using this little pitcher. Um, is going to be my main picture here, uh, and I'm going to get up and do a wide shot demonstration here in a second. Um, so I'm going to be far away, and you're going to be able to see me uh, from far away steaming milk, and you're probably going to have a lot of questions, like why are you so far away? This is not a good angle, uh, but I want you to see sort of the, the wider shot first, and then I'm going to share a couple of videos. One just of the, the up close of the machine itself, because I think it helps to have a working understanding of the machine. And then a top-down shot, so you can see exactly where the steam wand is going in, what the proper angle is, and um, the whole process from start to finish. It will also have better audio, so you can hear those cues I talked about, the auditory cues at the beginning and at the end of steaming. Zoom has a somewhat helpful but often not super helpful feature where if something's super loud or shrill, it mutes it or it dampens it a little bit. So my wide shot, you may not be able to hear those things quite as well, but when I share the video of the top down shot, um, hopefully that will be a little bit better for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get up here. So I've got my pitcher. This is the smaller pitcher, it's 12 ounces from top to bottom. Um, and when I go to steam, I'm gonna hold my pitcher in a certain way. Specifically, I'm gonna hold it in my left hand. Again, I'm right-handed, so I'm always gonna hold it in my non-dominant hand my left hand. And the reason for that is I want the one with the keys to the car, so to speak, to be in charge of turning things on and off and test the temperature. So that way, because this has the most control, I'm able to do things really quickly. And by doing it quickly, I'm able to stop as soon as it gets too hot to touch. If I'm using my non-dominant hand, it might take me a little bit longer to figure out um, how to turn things off and on. And those few seconds, uh, extra seconds, might take it just too hot. Um, or it might ruin the texture. So I'm using my dominant hand to assess temperature and to control the on off. Um, and then my, my left hand, my non-dominant hand, I'm just using to hold the pitcher and I'm gonna try to hold it straight up and down and level. So I'm not gonna tilt it one way or the other. Um, and then I'm also holding it in a specific way. So I'm not holding it like this where my hands are touching the sides and I'm not holding it like this where my knuckles are touching the sides. That is a safety thing. Um, if I turn the, the machine on and it's steaming and it gets too hot and maybe I panic or something goes wrong and I can't quite turn it all the way off and my knuckles are pressed here, this hand has no escape route and then I could potentially hurt or burn myself. Um, hopefully not badly, but it would be definitely uncomfortable. Uh, same for here, um, you're just like, the chance of uh, being uncomfortable is higher. So I just like to have my left hand only touching the, the handle. So you can see there's a gap between my, my fingers and the pitcher, and I'm just holding it loosely in my hand. And then I'm gonna be using my right hand to assess uh, temperature. So I've got my whole milk, and I'm going to go ahead and fill it just below the spout like we talked about. So just a pinky's width below the spout, or I could use these handy lines that are on the inside on these new um, La Merzeco pitchers. So I'm filling my milk here. And one thing I should point out about La Marzocco machines is that our steaming capability is super powerful. So these, uh, this Linea Mini in our GS3s, the claim to La Marzocco fame, so to speak, is that all of our machines are dual boiler. Dual boiler means that there is a boiler just generating hot water for brewing coffee, and then a separate boiler just for generating steam. That's important because of that temperature that we talked about, the steam being set between 250 and 260 degrees, and then the uh, coffee boiler temperature is usually between 199 and 203. So there's a big variance between those two. So if you have a single boiler, it will do both things pretty well, but not like ideal. By separating, they are just focused on their specific job. So they do each thing incredibly well, and you can do both at the same time. So I could pull a shot of espresso and steam, and I wouldn't have to do any waiting around. And that would make my drink uh, as fresh as possible. That being said, if you don't have a La Marzocco at home, um, and you're wondering how this will translate to your machine, uh, everything on, on a machine that's maybe not a dual boiler and has slightly less steam power, the angle of the steam wand still applies. The, um, 
uh, talking about the texture of milk and thinking about using cold milk, all of those things still apply. It's just going to take a lot longer for you to get the same picture that I get here in like 15 or 20 seconds. So everything that I do here is going to happen super fast. At home, you might have to spend a little bit more time trying to generate that texture. So uh, the thing that I'm going to do now is going to happen in three parts. First, I'm going to add the steam wand into the pitcher. And I'm going to put the tip just below the surface of the milk, maybe the first eighth of an inch. And again, if you're wondering, I can't see that, I'm going to show a video top down so you have a clearer view of what that looks like. But I'm just going to barely submerge the tip of the steam wand into the milk. And that's where I'm going to aerate. So when I turn it on, I'll start adding air. It'll go, ch -ch 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 -ch. it'll make that noise again. Um, and that's where I'm adding the air bubbles or the texture. And for this machine, I only really want to do that for about three or four seconds. And then I'll just very gently move the pitcher up just another eighth of an inch to submerge the steam wand the rest of the way. So I'm no longer adding air. And then I'll be looking for a, a tornado. I always want to say volcano. Volcano is bad. We're looking for a tornado. So the tornado is going to be the circular motion of the milk. And that's what's going to be building the, the remaining texture. And it's also going to be continuing to heat the milk until we get to that temperature, which is the too hot to touch on the sides. So I've got my temperature gauge here so I can also show that. Um, so the first thing I do before I steam milk on any machine is I always purge my steam wand, which just involves opening the valve and letting a little bit of water out of the tip. There's uh, water that builds up in the tip, it's just condensation. And we want to make sure that when we steam, it's all steam and we let some of that water out because if we're adding water to our pitcher, it's going to um, affect the texture of our overall pitcher of milk. So here we go. That's purging, just letting a little bit of water out. There's a little rubber grip that I'm going to touch here so I don't burn myself. And I'm going to pull it straight out towards you. And then I'm going to pull it towards myself about 15 degrees or so. That makes it so the angle of the steam wand is going to, and I'll use this, so it's going to be slightly angled in and pointed towards this wall, um, this wall here. And so then it's going to hit the wall and it's going to wrap around and it's going to create the vortex. I don't want to put the steam wand straight in because the uh, if you think about the steam, it's going to go straight down and then back up. And it's going to create the volcano, which we don't want. Um, and if I had it touching the side of the pitcher, it's going to hit the side of the pitcher and then it's going to shoot back. Again, thinking about the direction that steam will travel. So I'm going to uh, help direct the steam by pulling it straight out and over 15 degrees so it's slightly angled. Um, I'm going to connect my spout to my steam wand. That literally just means sliding my steam wand in so it's connected against the spout. And that helps guide my steam wand to the right angle so that way I'm not moving all around. Now I'm barely submerging the tip. I'm going to turn this on by twisting away from myself. Dropping my hand down, putting it on the side to test the temperature. And when it gets slightly too hot to touch, I turn it off. Uh, and then, I don't know if you can see this has milk on it. Um, it looks like kind of a corn dog now. It's baked on milk. I always have a clean, damp towel on the top of the machine that I'm only using for milk. And I'm going to wipe it off. And then I'm going to push it in on the tray and purge. There's some milk that will hang out in the tip, so I always want to purge it after I've steamed to be able to get rid of any additional milk. Um, but I don't want to purge when it's the steam wand's pointed out towards me and I have this in my hand, this towel, because if I turn the steam on, there's a potential the steam shoots out and I get steam burns. So anytime I'm purging it, I always just want to push it back into the tray so that way the steam's only going down. Uh, so I've got a nice texture here. And just to assess the temperature first, I'm touching it. I'm going to guess this is around 140 to 145 degrees. Let's do a live on-camera reveal here. 138, 139, 140. Bam, 139. So, so I'm right at that uh, area where I wanted to be, which was 140 degrees for my latte. And you can see I'm holding it by the sides right now. It's not burning me. It's slightly uncomfortable. So it's just that kind of like that initial, but it's not hurting you. That's around 140 degrees. And then it's going to be harder for me to show, but this is um, glossy, smooth texture. There's no big bubbles, and it looks like wet paint around the sides. That's called microfoam, and that's what you need to be able to pour latte art. And then just really quickly, 
Uh, I'm going to pour, I poured some milk out here and we'll watch maybe as it separates, maybe you can pick that up on camera, um, it, the two textures of steamed milk. So there's actually this heavy milkier part and then as this sits, you'll see the foam starts to separate even more. So that's the two textures that I was talking about. And the longer your milk sits, the more it will separate. So it's going to sort of constantly be forcing itself apart. And uh, so that is important to note because you want to use your steamed milk right away. You don't want to let it sit at all. If you do let it sit, it's going to be somewhat separated. So you just want to swirl it. Just give it a little bit of a swirl. That helps incorporate the two textures a little bit more. But the longer it sits, the less the swirling will work. So in general, just use your steam milk as soon as you can. Um, and then also you may see baristas tapping where they tap the pitcher against the counter. Um, that's to pop any big bubbles that might happen um, initially. There might be one or two after steaming. But you really only want to tap just a few times um, because if you uh, keep tapping again and again and again, you're actually going to be folding in air and it's going to make your texture worse. So I usually tap twice or, or once or twice and then I swirl and the swirl is going to give you much better results than the tapping will. So let's put that down and I'm going to go ahead and mute my video for just a second and I'm going to share my screen with you all. So you're going to get a better uh, view and top down shot. Again, as these videos are playing specifically the milk steaming one, try to listen for those cues um, specifically, because the noise is, is really helpful in addition to the hand. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mute this and share my screen. So here I have the undercarriage of the Linea May. I'm going to go ahead and show you the powerful, powerful steam wand there. Uh, that was being controlled by the knob, which is just directly above um, the steam wand. I'm only moving the steam wand around by this rubber piece. I can see as it goes down, there's a line here where the steam wand tip screws onto the wand itself. It's just important to note because it can be helpful um, a helpful gauge to see how far down you should have your steam wand into the milk um, by noting where that uh, line is in relationship to the milk. And then you have the tip of the steam wand itself, which has four holes that go around uh, the entire steam wand, and those four holes help disperse the steam just a bit more evenly. Uh, and then over here, the last thing relating to the, the steam pressure, over on your left, you have this gauge here that has a number going from zero to three. That's bars of pressure, and that relates to how hot your steam boiler is or how much pressure it's generating. So right now I have it set between one and a half and two, and when I turn it on, just watch the pressure gauge. You can see it through all that beautiful steam. It drops down to about one and a half. I find for me that makes a really good, it's a good mix of uh, low enough temperature that I'm not hurting the milk, but it's still generating enough dry steam that I'm able to get good texture from my milk. All right, so here we are topside after visiting the undercarriage of the Linea Mini. I have my pitcher here with this beautiful top-down shot filled with cold whole milk. I filled it just below the spout like I talked about in the beginning of the class. So that way um, I'm not going to over steam, it's not going to overflow, and it's also not going to scald or cook too quickly because I don't have enough milk in there. So it's just below the spout um, and I'm going to set that aside for now. I've got my steam wand here and I'm going to, before I get started, I'll always purge it. So I'll go ahead and give it a purge and that gets rid of any all right, I heard we're not seeing the video, so I'm going to go ahead and fix that really fast. Sorry about that. One second here. All right, so here we are topside after visiting the undercarriage of the Linea Mini. I have my pitcher here with this beautiful top-down shot filled with cold...
All right, so here we are topside after visiting the undercarriage of the Linea Mini. I have my pitcher here with this beautiful top-down shot filled with cold whole milk. I filled it just below the spout like I talked about in the beginning of the class. So that way um, I'm not going to oversteam, it's not going to overflow, and it's also not going to scald or cook too quickly because I don't have enough milk in there. So it's just below the spout, um, and I'm going to set that aside for now. I've got my steam wand here, and I'm going to, before I get started, I'll always purge it. So I'll go ahead and give it a purge, and that gets rid of any steam, uh, or excuse me, any water that's built up in the tip. So I wanna make sure that I purge all of that water out so it's just steam, so that way I get the best texture in my milk um, that I possibly can. So first thing I'm gonna hold in my left hand is the pitcher, so my non-dominant hand. Doesn't matter if you're left or right, but in this case, I'm right-handed, so I'm holding this in my left hand, making sure my knuckles don't touch like we talked about. Um, then I'm gonna grab the steam wand itself after I've purged it, pull it straight out and over about 15 degrees. I'm going to connect the spout to the steam wand. So click and lock. And the reason that I do that is I really want to make it as easy as possible for myself to keep the steam wand at the appropriate angle. And if I don't click and lock these two, I'm sort of choosing my own adventure, if you will. And I have the opportunity to go rogue and go all over the place. And that's just not very consistent. You may get okay milk with that, but you won't get consistent pitcher after pitcher. So I'm locking these two things together, and that just allows me to have a guide so I can go up and down. Once I have it connected, I want to make sure that my steam wand is about center back, so just right around there. That is going to be the best angle for me to get the best texture, because you can imagine the steam coming out, and it's going to hit the wall, and it's going to wrap around, and it's going to create a beautiful vortex. After that initial ch -ch 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 of adding air, it's really important that we have enough time, almost the majority of the time spent creating that uh, tornado. The tornado is what's going to give us the beautiful texture. It takes the big bubbles that we've added and it makes it smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, it's also really important that we uh, listen to the auditory cues as we're steaming. So when I get started, listen to me aerating or adding air. It should sound like shh, 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 shh or maybe it'll sound like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. The quality of that noise is what's going to help us determine what to do next and when. So if it's really controlled, like small bubbles that we're adding, we know we're adding small controlled amounts of air. So we can aerate for just a little bit longer because we're just adding a little bit at a time. If it makes that crazy noise, that we know that we've added a ton of air right up front. So we need to submerge the steam one just a bit so that way we can spend more time in the vortex, uh, texturing the milk, getting rid of those big bubbles and making them smaller and smaller. So listening at the very beginning and then also at the very end of steaming. So when I go ahead and turn off the steam wand, you'll hear uh, there's a noise, it's like a medium tone. It sounds almost like an airplane taking off but not so low and rumbly. That noise can be associated with the temperature of the milk itself. So maybe my hand is inaccurate and I, I'm having an off day and I turn this off and it sounds super high pitched and squealy, that would be a good sign that my milk was under temperature or be a little bit too cold. If it was super low and rumbly, really true to that airplane taking off, really low, um, that would be too hot. That would be well above 160 degrees. That's where I'd be denaturing the proteins in the milk, scalding the milk and producing really awful flavors. So what I'm looking for is a nice medium tone. All that to say, uh, listen to the sounds at the beginning and at the end of my steaming, and that should give you um, guideposts for what you're looking for when you're steaming at home. So I'm gonna click and lock. I have this steam wand centered, but slightly pointed towards the back wall. And then I don't know if you can see, there's the little bit of a line where that steam wand uh, tip connects to the rest of the steam wand. I just wanna barely submerge the tip of the steam wand about an eighth inch, and I'm not exceeding that line. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. You could hear that kind of medium bubbles, I would say, that I added. So I went up just a little bit sooner to submerge the steam wand using my hand. And then a nice medium tone at the end. I would say this pitcher is gonna be a little bit on the warmer side. Let's see here. First, I wanna make sure I grab a towel. Nice uh, damp towel, clean towel, and then purge. Get rid of, you can see there's excess milk, any excess milk from the tip. And what I've ended up with 
is this milk that's glossy and smooth. There's one or two bigger bubbles, but it's not too big of a deal because they go away when I swirl it. The swirl is kind of key to maintaining the texture of the milk. So if you have to steam and then let it sit for a while, just keep swirling it. That helps keeping, keep it from getting too separated. Remembering that there's two textures of steamed milk, the heavy milky stuff at the bottom and then the light airy foam at the top. We want it to be as homogenous as possible. And so you can see here that it's glossy. Um, I don't know if you can see the light reflecting off of it, but it looks pretty good to me. And this is a really beautiful picture of steamed milk. Now testing the temperature on the side. I'm gonna say that this is on the hotter side. I'm gonna say that this is around 145 to 150. 147, nice, so I'm, I'm splitting the difference there. So this would be great for like a latte, anything that's above maybe eight to 10 ounces. Um, and see, so as milk rests, it starts to rise in temperature just by a few degrees, so this is 150. So this is a great latte temperature. So anything that would be bigger that I would sit and um, drink for a period of time. If I had something smaller, I might wanna to stop steaming just a second or two sooner and be closer to that 140 mark, then the milk will be a little bit sweeter and you can drink it a lot faster. But this is perfect. I would definitely use this for a latte, be proud of it, um, but work on getting the temperature as close to 140 as you can. Yeah, and that's a, that's a pretty good pitcher of steamed milk, so I'm, I'm happy with that for sure. All right, so thank you for bearing with me with my uh, sharing of the video there. Um, quickly becoming a Zoom super user, but I'm not quite there yet. Uh, so hopefully that top down shot showed you um, just a little bit more what I was talking about with the angles. Uh, I think now would be a great time for us to go into the Q&A. So you've seen sort of my tips and tricks for steaming, but I bet you have a, a million questions. So I'm gonna check my phone here and see what questions have been asked. Um, and then I can try to answer those in real time and maybe they will inspire more questions. So the first thing that I'm seeing the most of is questions about alternative milk, specifically oat milk, right? That's the most popular these days. Um, so everyone wants to know how do I steam oat milk just a little bit better? Uh, so I have a little bit of oat milk here. This is the Pacific uh, Barista Oat Milk. There's also a brand called Oatly. There's a brand called Minor Figures. They all do a really great job of uh, creating these barista edition oat milks that steam really well and don't separate in your coffee. Um, you specifically want to pay attention to the designation of barista. Uh, it has a few extra things in it to stabilize it so it behaves more like whole milk, um, so it has the texture that it needs, because generally there's not as much protein in it as there is in uh, regular milk, so on and so forth. So tips for steaming, oat milk particularly steams, if you have the barista edition, steams pretty close to whole milk. I would say you need to maybe aerate it just a bit less, so that initial ch -ch 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 noise, do that for just a second or two less, and then also uh, maybe steam it just a little bit cooler. So not quite too hot to touch, but just a second or two before. Um, it's just a, it's a few minor tweaks that will really make uh, it better for you overall when you're steaming your milk. Um, oat milk is the easiest to use. That's why I have it in the house. Uh, I really like to have success pouring latte art. You can see the beautiful latte art on the package. Um, almond milk is notoriously difficult to work with, but it's still possible to get good latte art. Uh, soy milk is the classic, um, Rosetta pour, so it's, it's possible, but each type of milk alternative, whether it's soy, oat, coconut, hemp, barley, whatever uh, milk that you're using, they each have their own specific set of parameters. So, but in general, milk alternatives like to be steamed a little bit cooler and with just a little bit less aeration up front. So that's a really great question, um, and I will see what else people have to say here. All right, so question, are larger pitchers easier for latte art? Uh, that's a great question. So larger pitchers, meaning this is that 20 ounce pitcher that I talked about, the big one. Uh, this obviously is a latte art specific question, but just something to consider um, as you're experimenting at home. Sometimes, uh, like in latte art competitions, what have you, people will steam a small amount of milk in a small pitcher like this, and then they'll transfer it to a larger pitcher. And that allows the foam 
the light airy foam to incorporate a little bit better with the heavy milk. And then when you pour latte art, it gives more movement to your latte art. So you're able to get bigger and different shapes. So it is something that you can experiment with. It's definitely not necessary. I could get latte art by steaming and pouring out of this pitcher. You just get a different type of latte art by, by switching to a bigger pitcher for a smaller cup. All right, so let's see. Difference of milk texture based on beverage. So that's a super great question. So what's the difference between cappuccino texture and latte? What's the difference between a latte and a flat white? What's the difference between a cortado and a latte? Uh, I could keep going forever. This is the number one question that I got when I was a barista um, is really what's the difference? It's super regional, the difference, honestly. Um, how much coffee goes into a cortado versus a flat white? I'm from the Midwest where we called cortados Gibraltars. Um, there's all of this debate. So what I say is based on my understanding of where coffee is right now, particular to the Seattle area, uh, and my understanding of the Seattle area, it kind of changes from place to place, but this is a good overview. In general, cappuccinos have slightly more foam. So they're slightly more aerated than a latte. Over the years, that has changed a bit. So if you remember lots of uh, cappuccinos from the early 2000s, and it was just like just mounded foam, they literally scooped the foam on top. Um, it was really dry, like stiff foam. That's changed a bit now, where most cappuccinos look similar to lattes, but in reality, they have just a little bit more foam, so a little bit more aer aeration. Um, also, cappuccinos uh, are served now in these like six ounce cups. Um, six and a half ounce cups or so. Uh, that's a traditional style cappuccino. They're generally not um, different sizes anymore. Uh, and anything less than I would say eight ounces, I generally steam on the cooler side. So I would say between 135 and 140 degrees. And that's because I'm gonna be drinking it really quickly. I don't need it to sit for a really long time. And that 135 to 140 is where the milk is the sweetest. If I had something bigger, like 10 ounces or 12 ounces or 16 ounces, I would definitely be steaming up to 150 because I know I would be sitting with it for a while. And I would want it to be at least warm the entire way through. Because the whole point is that I want to enjoy it. You know, like I could be a real stickler and only steam to 140 and then be drinking my cold milk and not be enjoying myself. But I, I want to enjoy myself. So I want to take it up to 150 so that way it's going to be nice and hot. Uh, a latte is just going to have a little bit of foam on top. So it's not going to be nearly as foamy as the cappuccino. And the, the difference in foam is just the amount of time that you're aerating at the beginning. So it's literally a second less for lattes and cappuccinos, just a few extra seconds of that sh -sh 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 noise. And one way that you can see that is you can see when you put your milk in, right, you fill right to the spout and then it stretches. You can see how foamy your milk is by how much it stretches. So it, like a cappuccino, I might fill just to the bottom of this spout, and then it might stretch all the way up to the top. A latte, I might fill to the bottom of the spout, and I might only stretch it just to the middle of the spout. The same amount of milk, uh, just different aeration techniques. Um, the last thing is a, a cortado. So this is a sort of smooth cortado glass. Um, it is uh, roughly four ounces. Cortados in general have the same texture or a little bit less texture than a latte. Um, so it's equal parts espresso and steam milk, and it's just gonna have really light texture. So ultimately as home baristas, you get to choose what makes sense to you um, and have a, you know, create your own, like this is the kind of texture that I want when I'm using this specific glass. But that's sort of a working idea of, of texture throughout the industry. So. Really great question. All right, so let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, question, is there a difference in steam wand angle for single nozzle wands? So one of the things that I pointed out on our La Marzocco machine is that it has four holes on the steam wand tip, um, which allows you know, perfect texture and it creates everything super easy and it's just super simple to use. Not everyone has that set up at home. Some people have a steam wand that just has one hole. Um, the angle itself will change slightly because you want to think about that one hole sort of sitting just at the surface, but also angled. So if you can picture this is the steam wand and this is the surface of the milk, you'll want half of the hole exposed to air and the other half sort of submerged. So that way you can be adding more air um, initially. It's just something you'll have to play with. Um, but in general, you still want to think about where that steam is going to be shooting out. So you still want to have it kind of match the angle that I talked about, but the depth that you start at might be the variable. 
um, for a single hole. Really great question. Uh, so let's see what else. Okay. So people are wanting to see some badly steamed milk. Cool, let's do it. Uh, I'm gonna badly, I'm gonna steam some milk uh, badly. Um, I will say that, you know, milk is expensive. We know this, it's a product. If you sh overshoot and you have milk that's 150 degrees or 160 degrees or maybe 120 and, and you're gonna use it anyway, there's no shame in that because we don't wanna be wasteful of milk or maybe the texture isn't perfect. The thing that brings me back to coffee that I love about it is it's addicting because you, there's always something I did that I could do better. I like, I'm, there's always one thing where I'm like, ah, but next time I'm gonna do this with my shots of espresso or with my steamed milk. So you're gonna have another opportunity to make a, a better pitcher. So you might as well use the one that you have and then um, just try to do better next time. But that being said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steam um, a, a bad pitcher. And this is gonna be, again, subjective and mostly bad in terms of four latte art. Um, I'm going to steam it too hot, and I'm also going to try to really mess with the texture so it's going to be super fluffy. Um, that being said, it's kind of hard to steam poorly on the mini, uh, but I'm going to do my best. So I've got my pitcher here. I'm going to get up, just quickly steam some milk. I'm going to fill it just below the spout like we talked about before. I'm going to purge, pull the steam wand straight out and towards me, 15 degrees or so. Connect the spout rise up, uh, like sink just below the surface, and I'm gonna turn it on. And if you can hear, if Zoom doesn't mute me, try to hear the noise of, of me over aerating. And then when I turn it off, the noise of too hot, it'll be really low and rumbly. pitcher of milk here, which is definitely going to overflow. And I don't know if I can get the angle here, but I don't know if you can see how big those bubbles are and already just right off the bat. The foam itself looks a lot different. I'm going to pour from the other side. Okay, so I don't know if you can see, but this is almost all foam. It's just like a blob. It's just blobby. Uh, so it might taste good. Um, I tend to like, you know, kind of over aerated foam. It brings me back to those cappuccinos of the early 2000s, late 90s. Uh, but it's not going to be ideal for latte art. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and that happened because I went super um, far uh, on the, the aeration. And then I probably want to see the temperature as well. So I actually didn't do too bad on the temperature, <laughs> 140. One of the things that happens uh, when you're, you're steaming and you've trained your hand is it becomes really difficult to oversteam the milk because your brain just says time to shut it off and you just do it. Uh, so it becomes one of those things where once you have your hand dialed in, it actually becomes hard to, to go under or over that because it just does it every single time. So I didn't maybe succeed on the over temp, but I definitely got a pitcher that's too, too airy for, for latte art. It has these really big open bubbles that doesn't look like microfoam, it doesn't look like wet paint, it just looks kind of like meringue. Uh, it's not gonna be any good for, for latte art and maybe not ideal to drink. Um, so I'm gonna set this down here. And then I'll uh, read some more questions. So thank you for asking that. Uh, have I noticed any definitive difference using homogenized milk or non-homogenized milk for lattes? That's a really great question. So first, I think, what is homogenized milk? Homogenized milk is like the gallon that you get in the grocery store. It's all one liquid. The texture isn't different at all. And they've actually forced fat through like a little nozzle to disperse it evenly throughout the milk. So that way it doesn't separate. Um, Non-homogenized milk is like the cream top that you see at the grocery store. So it has that layer of fat on top. Um, I've used both, um, both as a commercial barista and just at home. The benefit of homogenized milk is it's super consistent. So it has roughly the same amount of fat in every pitcher that you're pouring out. Non-homogenized milk or cream top milk has that big blob of fat, for lack of a better descriptor, 
And if I punch that down into the milk and kind of try to stir it around, maybe I shake it a little bit, I'm still gonna have some pitchers that have some big globs of fat that fall into it and other pitchers that don't have as much fat. So then my steaming becomes more inconsistent and it's a little harder to achieve perfect texture every single time. That being said, non-homogenized milks are usually like grass-fed and local dairy, and so they, they have a really beautiful flavor. So that might be something that you get to decide that if you wanna play with it at home, if you'd rather have convenience and predictability, then go with homogenized. If you would rather have um, sort of a, a wider array of flavors and you're okay with the, the variability, then maybe use non-homogenized milk. Um, also, uh, I should mention that grass-fed milk specifically throughout the year will have different qualities to it. So there's some parts of the year where it will smell super grassy and be really thin and not have as much fat because the diet of the cow is changing. Um, and then other parts of the year it will be super fatty and delicious and sweet and creamy. And again, that all just depends on the diet of the cow. So that's one more variable you're introducing. So there's a high risk, high reward um, in my opinion. All right, let's see. Uh, how to make hot chocolate. So uh, we're getting some hot chocolate questions. Uh, that's a, a great um, thing to make for people, right? We have these espresso machines in our home. We're not necessarily drinking coffee all day, um, unless maybe you're uh, Italian. <laughs> but uh, so, but we have a steam wand, which and now I'm noticing I didn't wipe off, which is like such a shame. But I'm going to go ahead and wipe it off now. Uh, so to make hot chocolate, you really just need chocolate of some kind. It can be a bar of chocolate that you break up into the bottom of the cup or a chocolate sauce is what works the best. So like a Hershey's chocolate or maybe you can make your own hot, uh, chocolate sauce at home. Um, and then you would just take your cup and put a little bit of hot chocolate in the bottom or the chocolate sauce itself or the chocolate pieces. And then maybe you have a little cocktail whisk. Steam your milk, steam it hotter than you would for a latte. So steam it right up to that 155. So pretty much as, as hot as you can get it. And pour a little bit of milk into the bottom of your cup. Take your cocktail whisk and whisk it until it's pretty well melted. At that point, it will simulate uh, espresso. So it will provide contrast. So if you did want to pour a latte art, you would be able to um, get contrast. And then you would just go ahead and pour the milk all the way up to the top. If you wanted, you could put whipped cream on it, you could dust it with some cocoa powder, um, but it really is just chocolate sauce in the bottom of the cup or bits of chocolate that have been melted. So you can go crazy with super high-end, single origin, uh, expensive chocolates, or you can go for good old Hershey's. Either one, uh, those will be super delicious and it'll be really good use of, of your milk steaming wand. So that's a really great question. Um, all right, let's see here. Bear with me while I find out. All right, do you submerge the steam wand deeper as you go? So I talked about having the steam wand sort of just below the surface of the uh, milk when I start, and then I slide up just like an eighth of an inch. I'm really not submerging the steam wand much deeper as I go is the answer. So after that initial aeration, the psh, 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 I just move up just like, just a, just a scooch, uh, just a very little bit. Um, in my in-person classes, that's always, the, the tendency is to have a really dramatic movement and to move the pitcher up the steam wand so then the steam wand hits the bottom of the pitcher. That's what we're trying to avoid. I'm really just trying to sink the steam wand a little bit below the surface so I'm no longer adding air. And then, uh, depending on your steam, if you have the angle of your steam wand right, um, you're really not going to have to move it much at all because as the milk grows, as it stretches, starts out here and it grows here, it'll sort of naturally cover the, the steam wand holes itself. Sometimes you have to, to help it along if your angle's not perfect by moving it up just a titch, but you don't need to, to do that more than once. It's one small movement and then stay, stay the course, um, do the vortex, and then turn it off when it gets too hot to touch. So a really great question. Um, awesome. So let's see what else we have here. So, perfect. So, the larger pitcher, getting more, uh, so a dry cap versus wet. Um, so, a dry cappuccino versus a wet cappuccino. Uh, maybe you've heard someone in line at the coffee shop be like, I want a bone dry cappuccino. Uh, that is just a way to indicate how much foam there is in your latte art. Um, so, if you are someone who wants to make a dry cappuccino, uh, do the opposite of what I just said. Instead of moving up uh, a little bit, 
once you know you're done aerating you'll actually gently move the pitcher down and that's to keep the holes exposed in the steam wand tip and you keep kind of building that texture um, eventually so you'll do that for moving down for maybe three or four seconds longer than your initial aeration so like six or seven seconds total and then you still do want to sink the steam wand a little bit and have some time spent in that vortex um, and that's how you'll get more more foam to do a, a cappuccino that being said there'll still be some heavy liquidy milk at the bottom so if you really wanted to get just foam like super dry you can take a spoon or like a butter knife and you can cover the tip and you can pour out and that'll hold the foam back and then you can pour out the heavy liquid liquidy milk and then what will be left is just your foam and then you can kind of plop that on top and you have your bone dry cappuccino experience. Um, opposite of that is a no foam latte. Uh, so if you don't want any foam at all, um, on a La Marzocco, it's kind of hard to get a no foam latte just because it does have the four steam holes and it will develop some texture. But I call that the sink it and scream because you'll sink the steam wand right away just below the surface and turn it on. And it kind of traps a little bit of air in the steam wand and it creates this really high pitched screaming noise that will last the duration until you get it to the right temperature and then you'll turn it off. So not a super pleasant soundscape, but uh, it definitely will give you a hot milk that doesn't have as much texture uh, maybe as, as a regular latte would. So just a, a tip there. Um, question, what is the best large milk brand for latte art? I don't know. Um, I'm using Organic Valley whole milk right now from the grocery store. I find that that has a really good flavor and it textures really well. Um, I would encourage you to do some experimentation uh, to that effect. You don't, that doesn't mean you need to buy a gallon. Like I understand, you know, people have limited resources right now. Everyone's resources are limited. So, um, but in, in maybe better times or if you see the opportunity, you can buy those little containers of milk, maybe buy one or two or three brands um, of those milks and then do side-by-side uh, -side tests and see what works best for you. Because maybe you have a local dairy in your area or a big brand in your area that you actually really, really like. Um, and for the most part, the only way to know is to experiment. Also because it's super specific to your machine. So there might be some milks that work really well on a Lama Soko that maybe don't work as well, you know, so it's just something that you need to, to experiment with. But in general, the organic value that I'm using right now is, is super tasty and it works really well. Um, so great question. All right. I can take one more question. Uh, can you add cinnamon or chocolate to the milk to steam? So you can't like, you can add stuff to the, the milk in your pitcher and then steam it. I recommend people don't because as you saw when I purged the steam wand, a little bit of milk came out. So some of, if you add like a syrup or something sugary, that can actually get up into your steam wand. And if you don't clean your steam wand regularly, um, you know, it's just gonna be kind of icky and, and produce off flavors. It won't go into the boiler because there's actually a breaker there that a one-way valve that's stopping that from going into your boiler, but in the steam wand itself. Um, so I generally recommend never adding any syrups into your pitcher, but instead adding them to the cup and then stirring before pouring. And that's just gonna treat your machine the best. That's my, my recommendation. And if you wanna add cinnamon, putting cinnamon on top of your espresso or on top of your chocolate um, is gonna give you beautiful contrast and you're gonna get really crazy latte art because you've added all this contrast on top. So uh, that's my recommendation anyway. All right, so that's gonna wrap up the Q&A. Thanks for, for bearing with me during this class. I know you all probably have a ton of questions. Uh, please reach out to me at uh, leah at lamarzoco.com. And then again, my, my boss slash buddy, Dave, um, we're more than happy to answer all questions that you have about Lamarzoco machines, about coffee in general. I'm a huge nerd, I just wanna talk to you. Uh, so send me an email. Um, and then also follow us on uh, social media to learn more about um, any upcoming promotions or things that we're running uh, at lamarzocohome.com. Um, I would do just for one last thing, I want to shout out the coffee that I'm using right now. I'm using Little Waves Coffee Roasters from uh, North Carolina. And this is that Tierra de Mi Padre. If you took my class last week, I talked about it. It actually got delivered uh, as I was giving the class. So this is an amazing coffee company. Um, it's littlewaves.coffee if you want to order a bag. Um, do your best to still support your local roasters right now. And I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate you all so much for being here, and I look forward to hearing from you later. Thanks, y'all.